we have a lot of uncertainty in our world today. I mean, you just look at the news and what's taken place over the last few weeks all around the world. Just crazy things happening. Things that, you know, we thought we'd never see again in our lifetime. You look over in Ukraine and how Russia has come in and they've invaded that country. And now there's whispers and talks of, you know, possible World War III. And what happens if this takes place? And what happens if this step is enacted? And we sit back and we just don't know. We don't know what the future holds in a lot of those areas. But you don't have to look to the global stage and you don't have to look at what's happening in far off points of the world to understand that the world that we live in a lot of times is uncertain. I mean, I've stood in hospital rooms with family gathered around and prayed with them and tried to comfort them. When in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that pain, they simply don't know what the next few hours may bring. You know, we've had moments in our lives where, where thankfully things have turned out okay, but in the middle of the night waking up with kids to all of a sudden be quickly rushed off to the emergency room or rushed off to the hospital. And as you're sitting there driving way too fast down Manatee Avenue on your way to Manatee Memorial Hospital, not knowing what the next few hours will bring, how in those moments do we pray? How in those moments do we cry out to God and say, Lord, we need help? And, and, and what's the mindset that we have when we bring those prayers before the Lord? Well, Paul writes about that in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and, and, and as we look at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27 this morning, you know, we see a passage that I imagine many of us have quoted and many of us have, have recited over and over again. Uh, and our men's prayer group that meets every Monday at 7 over here in our church uh, library. We have said this a lot. That Lord, even though we don't know what to pray for as we ought, we know that your spirit speaks on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. And that's a comfort to us. Uh, but a lot of times I think that we take that and we apply it to every single prayer that we ever pray. And, there's almost this mindset among the church where it's like, well, listen, we don't really know our real needs. We don't really know what we should pray for. The scripture kind of says it there. So it's not really important what you're praying for, just so long as you're praying. And I don't think that's necessarily what Paul's trying to get across in this passage. And it really helps when we look at this passage of scripture in the context of what he's been writing about all through Romans chapter 8. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to start in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Uh, but we're going to hop back a little bit just to kind of refresh ourselves of some of the things that Paul has already said so that we really understand what it is he's trying to say here as well. And so we come to the text in verse 26, and it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And so as we come to this verse, there's three things really that should jump out and kind of send up a red flag of like, hey, what is it that we're talking about here? The first one is the word likewise, the beginning of the sentence, because that always points that, hey, he's referencing something he just talked about. And so if we're really going to understand what he's talking about here, we've got to back up a little bit. So that's the first thing we see. Second thing we see, it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What does he mean by our weakness? What is it that we're talking about? Or we're going to see, do we pick up any answers as we backtrack a little bit there as well? And then he goes on and says that the Spirit himself intercedes with us, for us with groanings too deep for words. And the question that I have right there is, whose groanings are we talking about? Are we talking about the spirit groaning with too deep, with, with ideas too deep for words? Are we talking about our groaning that is too deep for words? Or are we talking about our groaning and the spirit groanings together? The spirit brings these groanings before God that are too deep for words, but whose groanings are we talking about? We're going to see if we can pick up some evidence and some ideas as we backtrack through the text a little bit here as well. And so that's kind of the first place that we're going to look. And so we see likewise, and as again, Paul has been talking in Romans chapter 8, especially in these past few verses, about those who are suffering in this present age. 
You go all the way back to verse 18, and he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so Paul's been talking about this groaning and this suffering that we have. He even said that, that yes, we are in Christ Jesus and there's no condemnation for us. We are so thankful for that. And that we are children and we are heirs of God, provided that we suffer with him. And then Paul launches into this whole idea that the whole creation is suffering. The whole creation has fallen. And it's not just the creation, but we ourselves, we groan inwardly as we live and we suffer in this world. And we see that all the time. You don't have to look very far, like we just said, to see that this world is groaning and falling apart. You know, we, as we live day to day, we experience pain, we experience suffering, we experience agony in this life. And so what Paul is trying to write, what Paul is trying to explain here is that, listen, that suffering that you're experiencing in this life, it's a normal consequence of this fallen state that we're living in. And Paul's trying to provide them some kind of help, some kind of encouragement, some kind of understanding that, hey, listen, when you experience pain in this world, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you have been cast off and that, that God is somehow angry at you and that's why you suffer. He says, no, listen, the fact that we suffer is a sign that we have that we belong to him. The fact that we suffer shows us that we understand that this world that we live in is not our home. That this isn't the right place for us to be. Have you ever gone to someone else's house? Like maybe for dinner, or maybe you're traveling and you spend a few nights with someone else, and you just kind of get that feeling and that sense of just oddness or differentness that that family has compared to yours? Like little things, like you know, you walk into their kitchen and like they don't keep spoons in the right place. And you open up their cabinets and you're like, well, that's not where cups are supposed to be. This is just not right. It's different. It's wrong. You open up the refrigerator and there's like a bunch of healthy stuff inside. And you're like, what's going on? There's a problem here. Right? You sit in that place and it just doesn't feel right. And then all of a sudden you come home and everything is off. Everything's the way it's supposed to be. Everything's right where it's supposed to be. And you get that feeling of comfort. And you get that feeling where you're able to relax and settle in and say, yeah, everything now is right. We as Christians should not have that feeling in this world. We shouldn't have the feeling that everything is just right and okay in this place because this is not our home. And right now, we are not in the presence of God. We live out in the presence of God. His spirit is within us, but there's still a distance that's there. And it shouldn't feel right. As we see the way the world works, and we see the way the world lives, and we see the way the world operates, it shouldn't feel normal. There should be a tension there. And so Paul writes and says, listen, as you are suffering in that way, and as you're feeling that suffering in that way, understand that that's normal. It's supposed to be that way. And you have this inward groaning that you live with because guess what? Things aren't right. And we understand that they're not right. But we have a hope, as he writes in these few verses, that one day everything is going to be right. And that is a great joy that we have. And so then Paul begins as he says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So in light of the suffering of the inward groaning that Paul's talking about, he mentions here that the Spirit helps us in some kind of weakness that we have. 
And, and this weakness could be a few different things. But when you put it in the context of the passage, to me it seems very clear that Paul's talking about the fact that, you know what? As we suffer in this life, we oftentimes don't really know the end result or the reason that God has for it. Especially when it's linked to the way we pray in the midst of that suffering. I mean, think of it this way. Let's say for a minute that you have a loved one who is sitting in the hospital. And they've gathered the family there and they're going to pray. How do we normally pray in those situations? We sit there and we pray and we say, Lord, please heal them. Lord, we want your blessing. Lord, we want your mercy. Lord, we want your grace. Please heal their body. Take away this sickness. Take away this ailment. Make them whole. Make them better. Restore to them the life they had. And that's the outpouring of our heart. But what if God and his will and God and his sovereignty has decreed that that family member, that it's their time to pass? And that God's going to use their passing for his glory, for the honor of his name, to bring people to his son Jesus. And we don't see all the inroads for those things, but maybe that's the purpose of it. And so then all of a sudden, as we are praying and we're calling out to God, God has a very different plan in mind. Because we, in our finite state, we, in our weakness, we, not understanding all the plans that God has for this world, we pray. And that's where Paul writes here and says that, listen, in our weakness, we don't even know how to pray the way we ought to. We don't even know that we, how to pray or what things we should be praying for. Because a lot of times the will of God is hidden from us. A lot of times God's will isn't declared to us. And we see this all throughout Scripture. I mean, you look at Paul. Paul was praying about the thorn that he had in the flesh. And as he was praying, he said to God, please take this away from me. We don't know what Paul's thorn was. There's all kinds of ideas, all kinds of articles being written about it. But simply put, we don't know what the thorn in the flesh Paul had was. But we know that it was a burden to him. We know that he wanted it gone because he says, I prayed and I asked God three times, please take this away. Remove this from me. Get rid of it. And then God gave Paul a revelation and said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And don't you see that, that I'm glorified in your weakness? And so then Paul stopped asking because that secret will of God was revealed to him. Now that doesn't always happen. In fact, it doesn't often happen as we live out our day-to-day -day lives. But the reason I say that I don't think we want to take this passage is just apply it to all prayer is because as we go through the scripture, we know that there's lots of things that we should pray about. And we know lots of specific things we could pray about. You take any command that God has given in the scripture for how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to follow after him, and we can turn that into a prayer and say, God, help me do exactly what your word says I should do. There are other times when the scripture commands us to pray. And so guess what? We should pray that way. And in fact, when Jesus was talking with his disciples about prayer, and they said, you know, Jesus, teach us how to pray, he told them how to pray. He gathered his disciples together and he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. He explained to them how to pray. And he gave them a simple idea and said, look, when you go before God, you want to worship him and you want to praise him. And then after you worship him and praise him, you come before him. You need to confess your sin to him. And then after you confess your sin to him, you offer up prayers and supplications for yourself and for other people. And so we know a lot of things that we should be praying for. We know a lot of ways that we should be praying. But specifically in this instance of suffering, we often don't know what the end result is. We often don't know what God's purpose or God's plan for our suffering is, except for the fact that the scripture tells us that as we face trials of various kinds, that we are to count it all joy, as it says in James chapter 1. 
In Peter's epistles, he says that, that we will suffer if necessary. And we understand that as we suffer and as we live in this life, that God uses those things to build our character, to build our faith, to draw us closer to him. And so what Paul is trying to communicate here, what Paul is trying to explain is he says, listen, this whole world is groaning in pain because of its fallen state, because of the corruption that it has been subjected to. We too, as Christians, groan inwardly, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We understand that this world is not right. We understand this world is not good. We understand that God has such a better plan for it. And so as we find ourselves in the midst of the suffering, we really don't know how we should be praying in those moments. Because if the suffering that I have leads to the end of my life, then I should be praying that my life ends in such a way that it glorifies God. And that's the way I should be praying. If God's plan is that my suffering is going to last for this period of time, and that I'm going to come out to the other end of it, and then my prayer should be, Lord, let this suffering manifest your glory in my life. Let me be a stronger Christian because of it. So then therefore, on the other side of it, I can serve you all the better. And that's the way I'm to be praying. But here's the problem. Where I sit in the present, do I know which path God is going to lead me down? I don't. And that's why Paul here says that, listen, you don't know what it is that you should be praying for. But here's the hope that we have, and here's the joy that we have, is that we don't need to know. We don't need to have it fully figured out, all the different directions that our life could take. We don't need to have it fully figured out, what the end result of the suffering of our life is. Because Paul says that we have a helper. That the Spirit, on our behalf, speaks with those groanings that are too deep. For words. And have we ever hit that point in life where there's just something happening or something going on and you kind of lose the ability to really put coherent sentences together? I mean, we gather in church and we pray in small groups together and we pray for one another and we like to have these eloquent prayers. You know, we like to have these prayers that have lots of big fancy, like, you know, godly words in them that we string together in these beautiful little phrases, and we pull scripture into it, and, and I'm not saying it's not heartfelt, but like, if we're sitting down and praying, we like to pray that way, because we're talking to God, and we want to, like, you know, make it this big thing, but haven't you had those moments where you go before the Lord in a moment of desperation, and you just don't have the words to say? In that moment, maybe you're sitting in that hospital room. Or you're sitting with friends and family who have lost someone, and you just don't know what to say. And there's that inward groaning and that feeling where you know that this isn't right, this isn't how it's supposed to be, this isn't the eternal state for us, and there's that groaning inwardly that just says, yeah, this is wrong. And so you go before the Lord, and you pray. Sometimes without words, sometimes just with that inward guttural groaning of pain. And then the Spirit takes that and brings it to God who knows every need that we have and ministers to us in that way. And there's a reason that I say that, and the reason comes from the text. You look at the scripture here, it says, The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I believe that what Paul is saying here is that as we groan inwardly, that the Spirit brings those groanings to the Lord, fully understanding what we need in that moment, and then ministers to us in that exact way. And I say that for a couple different reasons. First of all, I don't think this is just the Spirit groaning. Because the idea that we would not have words to communicate our prayers to God, that's not a problem the Spirit has. The Spirit is omniscient. The Spirit is a person in fellowship with God the Father. They have perfect communication between the two of them. The Spirit never has a moment where the Spirit lacks the words to say, to convey what it's trying to convey to God the Father. It never happens. There's perfect communication there. 
And so as we go back, we see another example here of the Spirit and our utterance working together to lift up and bring this request before God. Jump back a few verses in the passage up to verse 15. And here, Paul gives another example of the Spirit and our heart and our spirit coming together to praise God. In verse 15, the text says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So remember what Paul's saying there is that here, the Spirit testifies with our spirit as we cry, Abba, Father. So who is it that cries, Abba, Father? It's me. And my spirit cries, Abba, Father. My spirit recognizes that, that, that God is my Father. He's my Dad. He loves me. He provides for me. He cares for me. And I cry out to Him. And then the Spirit testifies with my spirit and shows that I'm a child of God. So there's my utterance being lifted to God by the Spirit. And I think that's the same thing that we see happening when it says it brings these groanings that are too deep for words. Because I sit there and I groan and I'm in pain, not understanding exactly what's going on, not understanding God's will, not understanding what it is that God's trying to work out in my life through this pain and through this suffering that we're experiencing. And so I groan and I cry out to my Heavenly Father, and then the Spirit, with my spirit, intercedes on my behalf. And that's the picture that we're being given here, and that's beautiful. Because, you know, it means that I don't have to understand perfectly everything before I go to my Father. Because the Spirit who speaks on my behalf is going to take those groanings that I can't utter. He's going to take my lack of understanding. He's going to take all those things that, that I just don't get about what's going on in my situation right now. And He's going to bring them before the Lord. And then God's going to work in my life. I remember when, after we had Nate, a um, year or so later, we got pregnant again. We were so excited. We're going to have this other baby come into the house. And I'll never forget, it was after a youth lock-in where we had like been up all night doing stuff. And Megan was at home, and I was doing the stuff at church. And came home about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning after being up all night with kids. And went home and just went to sleep. Because, you know, after you get done with the lock-in with a bunch of middle schoolers and high schoolers, you're pretty much dead. So I went home, laid down, conked out about 7 a.m., and all of a sudden at 8 o'clock or 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, my wife wakes me up and she says, something's wrong, we have to go. So Megan's parents come over, watch little baby Nate, and we rush off to the hospital. And the whole way over, the only thing I'm saying is everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine. We get to the hospital, and after a few hours being there, a doctor comes in to see us and explains that Megan's had a miscarriage. And then looks at Megan and says, well, were you hoping to keep this one? We're just broken inside. I look at my wife sitting there in the hospital bed, tears are just welling up in her eyes and she just won't stop crying. And in that moment, how do you pray? I didn't have any words to give her. I didn't have any, any idea of what it is that she was experiencing or going through. I had no idea what this would mean over the next few weeks or months in our life and in our marriage. I was 23, 24 years old at the time, completely unequipped to deal with the situation that we found ourselves in. But you know what we could do? We could bow our heads and we could go before our Heavenly Father and simply say, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this means. I don't know exactly how I can be of help. But God, I need everything you can give. 
And you know what? In that poor utterance, in that weak, small, pathetic prayer that I offer that is so helpless, the Spirit takes my groaning, lifts it to the Father. And the beautiful thing is, is that the communication between the Spirit on my behalf and my Heavenly Father is perfect. Because look what it says in verse 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, in that moment, when I'm sitting there with my wife in the weeks and days that follow, God knew exactly what was taking place. The Spirit knew exactly what was happening and going on in our lives. He knew the exact intention of it. He knew the reason for it. He knew that that would be something used in my relationship with my wife to bind us together, to make us closer together, to make us stronger together, and to make us more dependent upon Him. And He knew all these things. In that moment, I didn't know it. In that moment, I was a 24-year-old kid trying to figure things out, trying to understand how can I help my wife who's in pain. But God knew as I lifted those requests to him, as I prayed to him, as I, as I called out to him, he said, here. And he allowed us to walk through that together. He gave us strength that we didn't know that we had. But I'm sure that as we go around and if we were to sit there and tell stories of the times where we've suffered pain, where we've been confused, and all we could do was utter up those small prayers of desperation that say, God, I don't know what it is that's going on. I don't understand this. Why do you let these things happen? In those moments, the Spirit goes before us and says, here's what's happening in the life of your children. And then our Father ministers to our hearts this way. And this should give us a great encouragement. And this should give us a great peace as we live life. Because we're told here in the scripture that as we live through life, we're going to suffer in this way. We're going to suffer from time to time. And it doesn't mean that our faith is broken. And it doesn't mean that we've done something wrong. It means we live here and now, and that's the condition we find ourselves in. There are branches of Christianity that treat the whole idea of pain and suffering and loss in such an unbiblical way. Because I've seen people who gather together around others in their church, and they'll sit there and say things like, well, if you just had enough faith, then you wouldn't be going through this right now. Well, if you just had enough faith, you wouldn't have gotten sick. If you just had enough faith, your marriage wouldn't be in trouble. If you just had enough faith, that child wouldn't have died. And that's despicable. It's not biblical, and it's not what the Scripture teaches. Because the Scripture teaches plain and clear that we are children, then heirs, heirs and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with Him. And the fact is, is that we live in a broken place filled with hardship. But there's great hope for us. Because we haven't been left alone in this place. And that's why these words are so important for us to understand. And these words are so important for us to just plow into our heart. Because hard times come. And I can't tell you the number of people that I've seen make decisions in hard times. And man, I'll tell you what, you can tell where someone's faith is when those hard times come. Because when life is easy and life is good and life is grand and everything's going the way that it's supposed to be and you've got enough money in the bank and your marriage is going well and your kids are all healthy and just, just life's wonderful. So easy to be a Christian. So easy to say that God is good. So easy to say that God is loving and kind and benevolent and takes care of us. And it's so, so simple to say those things. But how many people do you see that all of a sudden when the hard times come, their faith just becomes a shipwreck? And they start to ask those questions, well, where are you, God? 
Why are you allowing these things to happen to me? Why are you allowing this suffering to take place? Why are you letting this happen to me when I've been good and faithful? See, when we should be looking at the scripture and we should be looking at what it says to say that, listen, the promise of Christianity is not an easy life. The promise of Christianity is not that you come to Jesus and suddenly all your problems fade away. But no, Christianity says that it costs something to follow Jesus. And that we should consider that cost before we follow him. The scripture tells us that as we follow after Christ that we will have trouble. Here, Paul has written that we live in this broken place and that we are children and heirs of his, provided that we suffer with him. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. And it's a more keen suffering than most people in the world experience because we realize that this isn't the way that it's supposed to be. And so we live in this place day in and day out, fully understanding and fully knowing that while we suffer, God is using it for good and God is using it for his glory. A lot of times I'll point to you know, the, the life that I had when I was a kid and the way that I was raised. I just see it so evidenced. In, in, in what Paul's trying to say here. And I look at my family growing up, and I look at the fact that my parents split, and I look at all the different circumstances that led me through middle school and high school, and it was a bumpy road along the way. I remember sitting in, in fourth grade being moved from Anna Maria Elementary School over to Pomasola Elementary School. And for the rest of my time in elementary school, I hated going to school every single day. Because we got uprooted from the home we grew up in, and we had to move somewhere else. And we had to go to a different place, and everything was changing, and everything was different. And all my friends were over here. And man, all the way through the rest of elementary school, and even into middle school, I hated going to school like every single day. Because that's not what my life was supposed to be at that point. Bad things had happened in my family, and my life had to change. And it was just a mess. But you know what? As I sit back and look on the way that I grew up now, I'd never change a thing. You know why? Because I am convinced 100% that the experiences that I had when I was 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, they developed in me a concern and a care for my kids that I would never have otherwise gave me a love and devotion to my wife that I would never have otherwise. And so you go back and you talk to 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old Chuck Carter about what things are happening in his house and what things are going on in his life and he would look at you and he would say, it's not fair. That's not what it's supposed to be. But you come to 34 year old Chuck Carter who gets to look back on the life that he grew up with. And what I say now is that was the hand of God developing me and who I need to be so that my kids can be who they need to be so they can go on and do great things for the kingdom. I don't know what plans that God has for my kids. I don't know what it is that he's got for them down the road, but I know one thing for sure is that my kids are going to be confident in the fact that their mom and their dad love them like crazy. And because they have that, they'll be able to go off and do things that I wasn't able to do. And that's all part of God's plan. And that's why we can go to him in prayer this way. We can say, Lord, I don't understand what it is you're trying to work out. Because I could have sat there and people were probably praying for me when I was a kid. Hey, ease Chuck Carter's pain a little bit. Lighten his load a little bit. Help his family a little bit. And yet they did so in ignorance because it was part of God's plan that I would experience those things and turn me into what I am today. And so what they should have been praying was, hey, God, use this in his life to make him a godly man. Use this in his life to make him exactly what you need him to be. But here's the thing. Sitting where we are, we don't know what the end result is. And that's why Paul says you don't know what to pray for. But here's the beauty of it. In those moments when you don't know what to pray for, you pray. You go before the Lord 
you lift up those prayers to him and you trust that the one who goes before you and intercedes on your behalf knows exactly what you need before you ever utter a word. And then God works in our lives according to the Spirit's witness because the Spirit intercedes on our behalf, what? According to our will and our desires and our needs? No. But it says here in verse 27, And he who searches hearts knows what is in the minds of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And that comforts me. That gives me so much hope and that gives me so much joy. Because God's will is being enacted in this world. And what we're going to see as we hop into the next part of the scripture next week is, guess what? I'll give you a little, like, you know, foreshadowing as to what we're getting to. Is all of that working out and all of that suffering and all that stuff that we see Paul writing about, guess what? It works out for the good of those who love him in accordance with his will. It works out for good, not evil. Good, not bad. Good, not destruction. It works out for good because it's his will. And that's a wonderful hope for us. That's a joy for us. And so as we sit there and we see all the different pieces of the puzzle floating around in this world, and we see relationships, and we see broken hearts, and we see pain, and we see joy, and we see gladness, and we see suffering, and we see all these things swirling and mixing around together, and what seems to us in the moment is chaos. We know that God is in control. That the Spirit is interceding on behalf of the saints in accordance with the will of God. And that truly all of that chaos is going to work out for good. The clearest picture that we have of that concept is in the crucifixion of Jesus. You think of all the things that took place in the crucifixion of Christ. You had Judas Iscariot who sinned as he went and committed treason against his Lord, handing him over to the Romans and handing him over to the high priest. You look at the false trial that took place where they were purposely bringing false witnesses to testify against Jesus, holding their trial at an illegal time, breaking their own laws and breaking their own codes. You have the Romans who washed their hands of the whole affair and just didn't want to deal with the Jews and their problems. And just to appease a crowd, took an innocent man and crucified him. You have the soldiers who beat him and scourged him. All of these horrible things taking place. And imagine being there from the perspective of one of the disciples. Your master has been arrested, carted off, taken away. He's been beaten and now he's being crucified. The clouds are swirling over him and the world is getting dark. And you look around and you think to yourself, this is madness, this is chaos. Where is God in all of this? And yet what? All in accordance with his will. All in accordance with his plan to save and redeem his own. And then three days later he rose from the dead and showed them that, listen, none of this took place was, was an accident. None of this was by mistake, but it was all in accordance with the perfect plan of God. And that's true of every moment of our lives, whether we can make sense of it or not, whether we feel like it does or not. The truth is, is that God is in control and that God is bringing all things about for the good of those who love him in accordance with his will. And so you know what? The suffering that we face in this time, sometimes it's good. Or at the very least, it will result in good. And that should bring us great comfort and great joy as we continue to serve Him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the fact that we know that the suffering that we face in this life truly is temporary. And as Paul wrote, that the sufferings of this age, Lord, they pale in comparison. They're not even worth noting or comparing to the glory that is to come. Lord, I thank you that the future that we have to look forward to is better than the world we live in now. I thank you, Lord, that the place that you are preparing for us is free from sin. There will be no more tears. And we will live in praise of you forever and ever. I thank you for these truths, Lord. 
And Lord, I pray that as we live in this place, that we would never feel comfortable with the world. I pray that we would never settle in and think of this place as our home. But I always feel, Lord, I pray that we would feel like aliens in this place. That we would feel like foreigners as we live in this place. Because truly, our citizenship is in heaven. And we belong with you. And so we long for the day that you'll come and take us home. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you that you provide us great hope and great comfort in the midst of our suffering. And Lord, thank you for the promises that as we pray in those moments when we don't understand, your spirit speaks for us. Your spirit intercedes on our behalf, all in accordance with the wonderful word and will of God. We thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. All in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.